Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Janet Coates. I'm the uh, Executive Director for Innovation and Strategy here at the Cronkite School. And in that role, I supervise the Reynolds Center, uh, which is the sponsoring uh, organization for the Barlett and Steele Awards. So I appreciate you all uh, coming out for the last Musty Monday of the semester. We'll return to Musty Mondays in the spring. Um, so this will this will be the, um, the, the best of, of the lot for this semester. We've got some um, wonderful uh, journalists here to share their, um, their work with us tonight. Um, before we get into the discussion with the, uh, with the teams of the gold winners and the silver winners for the Barlett and Steel Awards, I do want to take a minute um, to recognize uh, a very special guest with us tonight, one of the namesakes of this award, Jim Steele is with us. Um, Jim and his partner, Don Barlett are legendary investigative business uh, journalists in this country, probably the most honored team of investigative reporters, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, one, they've won two Pulitzers, two national magazine awards, more than 50 other national reporting awards have written nine books. Um, just this year updated um, their landmark uh, book, America, What Went Wrong, to look at some of the contemporary issues that have um, made income inequity and the struggles of the middle class in America even greater. Um, I've been a huge admirer of uh, Jim and Don. In fact, uh, when I was a student at the University of Missouri in 1983, Jim and Don won the uh, Missouri medal. So I was at the ceremony where they got that medal. So it's a special honor to uh, be able to introduce Jim to you tonight. And Jim, I hope you might honor us with a few words. Well, Janet, thank you so very much for that. You're very kind. Can everybody hear me all right? I think we all we all ask those questions when we're doing one of these <laughs> Zoom things, right? Because uh, it seems so weird. In fact, one of the funny things about Zoom conferences is when everybody's muted and you'll give a talk and you'll give a joke, nobody laughs. <laughs> so <laughs> you're sitting there like, did people hear that or get that? And so... Anyway, I can't thank you enough for your kind remarks about our work and uh, the reference to the Missouri Medal, which uh, needless to say, I've I not thought about in a while, but it's one of those awards that had to do with, with the body of our work. So we're, we're very, uh, Don and I've always been very, very proud of that award. Uh, and I'm very happy to be with you tonight and to talk about the, the projects that won tonight. Um, a couple of things about them that really strike me. One is all three are quite different. And that's a testament to, I think, how diverse journalism is today in America and, and the range of things that need to be explored uh, and the skills uh, with which people uh, approach these things and, and achieve those results. Uh, but at the bottom line on all of these, it's an it's, they're perfect illustrations as to why we as journalists need to shine a light on things and have always needed to shine a light on those kind of dark corners in American society where people are trying to get away with things. Uh, people are always trying to game the system, either globally, nationally, locally. And that's one of the great things that we and journalists try to do. We try to keep that light shined on them, to try to make sure there's as little of that as possible. Uh, I don't have any illusions that we will ever eliminate uh, injustices and uh, corruption and all the other things that go along when people have too much power for various reasons. Uh, but our job is to continually keep at that. The only thing I know for sure is all, all of us in investigative journalism are never gonna run out of work because there are a lot of these people out there always trying to uh, work the system to their advantage. But of the three uh, articles that, uh, the, the three projects that are received the awards tonight, um, I really can't say enough about the diversity of them. Um, in terms of the gold medal, the international consortium, uh, the sheer range of this project is breathtaking. 
and it's a reflection of the sophistication of journalism in our era. I mean, I think back to my own youth. Uh, I began as a reporter in Kansas City, and uh, I was taught some very, very fundamental and important rules about reporting, which still stick me stick with me to this day. Simple things like never assume, never assume how somebody's name is spelled, and never assume somebody who will talk to you. Never assume where you will find information. Uh, those were simple, primitive, but very powerful rules that have stayed with me. However, uh, when I think back to that time and I realize what we're doing with projects like the ICIJ project, for example, and certainly the one that the LA Times and the Center for Public Integrity did on the abandoned wells or the uncapped wells in California, as well as the M MLK 50 project in, in Memphis in terms of uh, uh, hospitals actually going after poor people who can't pay their hospital bills. All of these things are really a, a quantum leap from the simple ways that a lot of journalism was done in those days. We always had great anecdotal stories, people who could tell stories, people who could show us injustice here and there. But beyond that now, we've shown in very sophisticated ways through data analysis and documents, uh, just how widespread a lot of these problems are. So it, one of the great things of my career in journalism has been to see this evolution over time. And journalism today is much more scientific in many ways than it used to be. But at the same time, we haven't lost our human touch. It shows both the good humans and the bad humans and all of those in between. We just added to that some additional things that show uh, uh, the power of our, our, our field. Um, I don't wanna go on any longer on that other than just to salute the winners, to congratulate them and tell you how uh, honored I am that uh, my name and Don's name is on these awards because the work you've done with these projects is very much in keeping with what uh, Don and I believe is the heart of journalism which is systematic approach to issues, um, but at the same time, the human element and telling us why it's important. Uh, my motto in journalism has always been very, very simple. Tell me something I don't know. And all three of these projects uh, did that um, incredibly well. So thank you so much, Jen. Thank you, Jim. Um, but before we go into our um, talking with our uh, award winners, I do also want to acknowledge that we had um, a wonderful group of judges for the awards this year. Um, Paul Steiger, um, who is the um, CEO of ProPublica, uh, uh, Seska Antonelli from Bloomberg, and Don Hertzberg, who's a longtime financial journalist um, with Wall Street Journal and with Bloomberg. They've right. judged for us before and they did an exceptional job for us again this year and we're grateful. All right, so we're gonna jump to it now and talk uh, first to our gold award winners. Um, and as Jim mentioned, this was the award to the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Um, for an investigation uh, into the, uh, the, the Africa's richest woman um, and how she got that way uh, and how uh, some very well-known American uh, firms, consulting firms and uh, financial services firms uh, were involved in helping her to acquire and then maintain some of these um, ill-gotten gains. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce now the two reporters from IC, from the ICIJ, uh, ICIJ team who worked on this story. Uh, first, um, Sheila Aletti uh, and Sydney Friedberg, uh, who were uh, reporters on this project. Um, if you uh, want to talk to us a little bit, maybe start with explaining a little bit about what ICIJ is and how you work. So, um, hi, this, this is Sydney. Um, so Sydney. We, yep, um, we are a, an international consortium. We, uh, we worked on this project with um, 36 partners um, around the world, including the, um, the New York Times um, uh, Frontline, um, the BBC and many others. 
And I was, uh, so how did, it, how did this get started? Um, well, we got lucky at lunch. Um, <laughs> um, our uh, director, uh, Gerard Ryle, was having lunch in Paris with a, um, an old source of his, a guy by the name of William Bourdon, who was um, a French lawyer who's, who often deals with pretty prominent uh, whistleblower cases. And so Gerard had met him um, um, earlier um, on another story. And I guess um, um, the lesson for y'all about this is that um, it's important to sort of cultivate your, your sources carefully and tend to them. Um, uh, Gerard had made it a habit of inviting um, uh, Bourdon to lunch um, every time he visited Paris. And um, when uh, Gerard was in uh, Washington, they had used to have dinner together. So um, the way um, Gerard tells the story, uh, they were having um, dinner in a tiny bistro in Paris in a dark corner of a restaurant right across from um, uh, the lawyer's office. And um, they were sipping wine, uh, both red and white. And um, uh, 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 Mr. Bourdon told Gerard that he had this story. He had just come up, stumbled upon um, a massive uh, number of documents about the richest woman in Africa. And he was going to give them um, to a journalist. And so uh, Gerard is a, um, uh, a competitive Australian. And he <laughs> said, you're going you're gonna to give it to a, a, a journalist. You're not going to give it to ICIJ. And he said that um, um, we were very interested. And so uh, by the end of the lunch, um, Gerard had um, talked uh, Mr. Bourdon into giving him the documents. And um, um, a few weeks later, I was coming off another project with ICIJ and um, uh, um, uh, Gerard asked me if I'd like to work on this one. And that's sort of how um, a very long journey began. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Sheila to talk a little bit about what it was. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yes, ICIJ, as the name says, uh, works with um, uh, international partners and journalists around the world. Uh, this project um, was done by us, but also more than 100 journalists. We, so as you said, you know, this is a story about Africa's richest woman, but we rea realized early on that it wasn't just about her. It was basically a case study for kleptocracy. And so this means that, um, you know, it wasn't just a story about one poor country, but it was a story about how all these um, uh, enablers and facilitators around the world were actually helping um, her becoming um, Africa's richest woman. So that's why we decided to um, talk to our, to our colleagues around the world and do this project together to explore how um, this was possible thanks to enablers in Malta, the Netherlands, the US, uh, France, Portugal, and so on. Um, and that's how it started basically. And it's also how it continued for months um, until the end when some of our colleagues went to Angola to meet with the officials and interview them with questions that all of us together have prepared. Let's, let's um, put a little more detail uh, for our students on, um, on the, the richest woman in Africa. So Isabel Dos Santos, her father was the president of Angola. Um, Angola is a country that is rich in diamonds and oil, but is incredibly corrupt. Um, the people there are very impoverished, high infant mortality rate, uh, high illiteracy rates. So you've got, you know, a country with great riches and its people in great poverty and a leadership that is taking advantage of, of the uh, natural wealth of the country. And she is taking advantage of his position, correct? So she's building up this incredible wealth and then is consolidating that through all of these enablers, as you uh, pointed out, um, Sheila, in, in terms of, of this kind of international enabling. So it really does, I loved your description of kind of the anatomy of a 
kleptocracy. Um, that's really what we're talking about here is not just this one, um, this is really the case study and how a country can be pillaged basically by corrupt leaders. Right, and um, so, you know, it was really interesting at the beginning to get to know her without knowing her, without meeting her. Uh -huh. um, we did, um, we obviously had so many documents. There were more than 700,000 documents that we could see, but in those emails and um, documents, her presence was, was not that big. Um, you know, she would just give, um, some very short answers once in a while to, to her lawyers and so forth, but she wasn't really that much in the documents. So we started with Sydney and others looking into her presence online, for example, into the conferences that she had given because she had always presented herself as a, um, a self-made woman, um, a businesswoman who had uh, become so powerful and you know, wealthy because of her own skills. So we really started to listen to what she had to say and then uh, compare that with what we were seeing, um, which was basically that she had um, become so powerful because she, first she was the daughter of the most powerful politician of her country and one of also Africa's most powerful men. And um, which meant that she also had the law on her side um, as well as um, you know, um, countless um, uh, people around her helping her getting more and more rich, basically. So just to give you a sense of um, um what was in these documents, um, as Sheila was alluding, alluding to, you know, that's what sort of made this, the whole project was a, an incredible challenge. She started digging into these documents and, you know, there were uh, emails and contracts and invoices and government decrees and many of them were in Portuguese. So that was like the first issue. Um, and then the ones that weren't in Portuguese were in this incredibly dry and ridiculous English, often a county's, um, you know, a, a counting um, language that was impossible to understand. And so, um, and then the others that weren't in accounting English were so incredibly dry that you kind of said, well, who the hell cares about that? So during the project, um, um, I, and I think Sheila and probably many of our colleagues were, constantly thinking about and fretting over how to make people care about this story and how to write about it, a story that grabbed and kept some you know, people's interests. Because after all, every, every reporter wants to be read, right? So, um, um, and I'm, you know, a little later, I'm happy to talk about some of the writing challenges if you wanna get into the, uh, the nitty gritty of that. But, um, I, I did want to talk about three of the pivotal um, sort of challenges, reporting challenges, and lessons um, uh, uh, that you know we sort of took from this. And the first one is um, just about how um, a lot of investigative reporting involves um, tedious work, and uh, tedious work pays off. And I think the best example of this is um, how um, uh, work that was done by our colleague. Um, uh, Delphine, who put together a uh, an incredible, um, she works for our data team, and we have an amazing data and technology team. And so uh, Delphine basically led um, uh, a team of reporters in creating an interactive map um, that showed more than 400 companies that Isabel and her late husband, uh, Sindika uh, DiColo, had founded or invested in. And watching Delphine create this map was just an inspiration to me. Um, she and others um, compiled the list, uh, starting from names that we found in the leaked documents, and such as, you know, you find an email, for example, that was sent between Dos Santos's lawyers and her tax advisors. And then Delphine would research um, each company's history. And so in some cases, the leaked uh, data provided some useful, you know, uh, uh, official documents like the date that shares were purchased or, um, uh, you know, official documents from Angola that if you would just ha have to go to Angola to get, you could never get them. So they were sort of in, in our documents. 
So then the list of companies also would uh, serve for us, for Sheila and I and the reporting team as sort of an internal research and fact checking um, vehicle. Um, so eventually Delphine collected 800 companies and half of them tied back to Dos Santos and her husband. Um, and then she cross-checked um, all of the info against documents like in company registries or official gazettes um, and uh, uh, was able to use the documents to confirm that Isabel and her husband were indeed the true owners of these companies. And then she's assigned a business sector to each of the companies so that um, each one, uh, you could, it, it reflected um, the spread of the uh, uh, Dos Santos empire in telecoms and diamonds and oil in banking, et cetera. Um, so I think in the end, Sheila, there were, correct me, I think there were more than 400 um, companies and uh, subsidiaries in, in more than 40 countries. And uh, they included, I think more than nine, 90 of them were in secrecy jurisdictions like um, Malta, Mauritius, and, and Hong Kong. So um, that was um, the first sort of lesson. And then the second one was, you know, I mean, the second challenge was how could we show how the Dos Santos looting and the corruption that we were finding in the documents and could, could prove how did it directly affect the lives of Angolans? So, and how do we find examples, right, that everyone could relate to? And I think one of our uh, partners, our Dutch partner, um, Carlin, uh, delivered the answer to this in, 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 in spades. Um, the documents had told us about an obscure land deal uh, called the Columba Road Project. Um, and this was a $1.5 billion um, corrupt, no bid um, public works project. And Isabel's companies had got the deal through influence and peddling and it, they had received help from big banks, from a multinational dredging company, from a Chinese um, construction firm, from the Angolan government and from a Dutch trade agency. And what Carlin, but what Carlin found was something much more um, uh, vivid and uh, alive. Um, she had discovered these reports where um, of meetings between the project developers and local communities. And there were questions about and concerns about how families were get, had gotten forcibly evicted as a result of this redevelopment project that Dos Santos was involved in. So then Car uh, Carlin found maps in the data um, in the leak that we had that seemed to, to show the exact location of, of this redevelopment project was, uh, the map showed that the, the whole plan for the project cut through a vibrant um, uh, fishing community where 3000 people lived and it was called um, White Sands or uh, Aria Branca in, in, um, the, uh, in Portuguese. Um, but we were still uncertain, at least I was uncertain about whether the evictions were actually from the same area that um, um, uh, the same site. So Carlin went to Angola and she found the people and she found uh, the redevelopment site. And um, she found this incredible, wonderful school teacher, a mother of four who told her about how the government bulldozers came in the middle of the night and took out her house and many other people's house, houses. And eventually, but we still weren't convinced that it was, we, we wanted more than you know, witness statements. So Carlin eventually talked to bunches of people and she found a government official who finally confirmed that people were displaced because of Dos Santos's project. Um, so then, and the, then the third lesson, just from humanity to humility for a second, um, the, the third challenge, and this is sometimes pretty hard for investigative reporters, is that you, um, you, know, you should lead with humility. And the best um, example of this was the star of our project, who was our partner from Lisbon, a guy by the name of Mikhail Pereira. And he had covered uh, Dos Santos for years and years. And his biggest uh, get for the project was he helped 
confirmed that Isabel, Isabel's link to two companies um, that her lawyer had set up in Dubai uh, and that the documents showed um, got 130 million in consulting fees from the state's oil company, um, Sonangal, while Isabel was in charge of the oil company. Um, and these companies, it turned out, were formed uh, by Isabel's friend and business partner, a lady by the name of Paula Oliveira. So right on deadline, what happened was Mikhail was in, in the hospital with his wife who had a serious infection um, and was about to give birth to, the, to, a, to a baby. And so um, Mikhail was absolutely freaking out and he was incredibly um, anxious. And they eventually had a C-section on mom. Um, he had to spend 12 days in the hospital with her. And um, uh, thank goodness, um, you know, the baby was, is fine. And in fact, she just turned one two days ago. Um, so I'd like um, just to read something about, um, something Mikhail sent me about the project and he gave me permission to read um, about his lessons. And he said, with all the distance we have to keep because there is nothing so miraculous as the birth of a baby. In our work as investigative journalists, many times we don't know if we will be able to deliver what we are expected to deliver. That's why I believe that we always need to be humble. I think my commitment to Luanda Leakes was only, only possible because we fought together for a strong story. Um, I felt that when we all met in Paris. Um, at that moment, I knew I couldn't let anybody down. It was crazy, I know, to do everything there was to do in such a short time and in between to be able to do a very demanding field job in Angola. But there was a lot of creativity and a lot of team spirit. As there was always an enthusiasm and a persistent questioning about what we had and still needed to get, get that. And ICJ, ICIJ was always feeding that. That made us go a little further. When I was on the verge of giving up, there were always you and other ICIJ reporters sending me messages. And then I no longer felt embarrassed by my failure, but in, in, uh, inspired by your hope. That's how I did it. Oh, that's beautiful. And that's the joy of collaborative journalism, isn't it? When everybody comes together and supports each other that way. And when one person is down, uh, the others pick them up. That's a, that's a wonderful lesson from, from your work. I'm gonna shift over now and just I'm kind of watch the clock a little bit here and talk to our silver award winners. And then we'll come around back for questions um, after, after we have a little bit of conversation about um, the silver award, which went to the Center for Public Integrity and the Los Angeles Times for a project they did uh, entitled When the Wells Run Dry um, that focused on um, wells in uh, California uh, that oil and gas wells that were being left uh, idle and unplugged and uh, creating environmental and health uh, uh, risks for the people who live near them. And there are a lot of people who live near them and how the, uh, the oil companies and gas companies that walked away from these wells had not put enough bond money uh, aside with the state to, to compensate for the cleanup. So leaving this um, huge environmental and health uh, issue um, in the hands of the state uh, to have to spend potentially billions of dollars uh, to, uh, to clean up. Um, so we have um, to talk to us about that project, um, Mark Olalde, and uh, who's uh, was with Center for Public Integrity. Mark, I believe you've moved to a new gig, right? What are you doing now? Sure. Yeah, I now cover the environment for the Desert Sun, which uh, is in Southern California and is part of the USA Today Network. Right, right. And then we also have um, Ryan Meneses. Uh, from the Los Angeles Times, who did a lot of the data work on this, correct, Ryan? That, that's that, right. Right. Um, can Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started on this on this story? Sure. I, I mean, I wish I wish we had such a fascinating and and kind of intriguing story as a, a Paris cafe and and mixing wine, <laughs> but. Um, 
this was actually, you know, I, I think this, this story and how we did it speaks to the power, A, of collaborative journalism, but B, of nonprofit journalism uh, in particular. Um, this was one of the things where I uh, personally have covered the closure and cleanup of um, oil, gas, coal, gold mines, any kind of heavy extractives in a couple countries for the past couple of years. So I have, you know, just really, I was way too far down the, the rabbit hole in this one. And <laughs> um, I, I think what, what Mr. Steele was saying about <clears throat> taking, you know, what's been the, the benchmark of journalism forever and marrying that with a bit more scientific data analysis is, is kind of what we're doing right now. And that's what Ryan made this possible because he's the data whiz and, do, and does stuff that I don't even understand um, the faintest how he does it. So this project honestly just started when uh, I was actually a, a grad student fellow at the Center for Public Integrity and uh, the executive editor uh, liked the Los Angeles Times and wanted to rework with them. We hadn't worked with them for a while. And so he called me into his office and he said, do you have any stories in California? And I said, no, <laughs> give me, <laughs> give me two weeks and I'll come up with something. And, um, you know, I just started kicking around some charts and I talked to some regulators in California on background. I had a hunch this might be something. Um, when I started seeing charts that just showed oil and gas in California, just falling off a cliff, you know, 35 years ago and didn't see a whole ton of coverage. So, um, we essentially just went to the LA times and said, you know, uh, we can offer someone who has deep expertise in this segment of, of heavy extractives. And, you know, do you have a data whiz that you can, that you, you, you know, you can pair together. And it essentially just became a partnership between Ryan and myself. You know, there were obviously a lot of, of people on the teams that assisted, but we were kind of the, the brains of this. And, um, you know, it just became me hurling these questions at him that I, that were, so in depth and so niche. And he'd say, give me a couple of days, you know, I'm going to build this crazy data set and get back to you with it, with a scientific <laughs> answer. So it kind of just was trial and error and turned out that we found something. Ryan, you want to talk a little bit about the, the data piece of it? Sure. Uh, I'll start by saying why I was interested in it after the pitch came to us from Mark. Um, the Oil and gas extraction is kind of ever present in parts of LA, parts that I drive around all the time. You see pump jacks bobbing up and down, you see oil refineries. But uh, when I heard about Mark's idea, it wasn't until I went on the state regulators website to grab a shape file, um, which will just tell you the geo reference coordinates of wells in the state, publicly available, didn't have to ask anybody um, for it and put it into the mapping software I use called QGIS and saw just how many there were out there uh, far beyond the pump jacks that were visible to me. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them were under places that have been heavily developed, a lot of them under buildings. Uh, going a step further, we started to look at what the stats were when it came to their production. A lot of them had peaked in production 20 years ago. Uh, the outline of the story that Mark had envisioned covering extractives as he had was, was definitely there when it came to oil and gas in California too. Um, so that's kind of how we launched on it, why I was so interested in it. Um, you know, in fact, we published a interactive map for people to be able to see mm -hmm. across the state uh, where low use wells, where wells of all kinds, but particularly these low use abandoned wells were. And a lot of people, even colleagues of mine, were asking if parts of it were a mistake, you know, to see yeah. hundreds of wells underneath uh, the neighborhood Echo Park, for example. I, I live pretty close to it. It's really close to Dodger Stadium uh, here in L.A. And there's tons of development that's happened uh, over hundreds of abandoned wells that have never been properly plugged. Um, and there was an issue while we were working on these stories with one of the wells that a developer was trying to remediate. Uh, it was almost a year ago now, um, as they were trying to build some fancy condominiums in a mm -hmm. place that has not much affordable housing. Uh, to start with, they nicked the base of a well, some oil uh, came spilling out of it. And it just kind of showed the persistent issues as we started to talk with people in the neighborhood, the persistent issues that people have to deal with, it's kind of a recurring nightmare. So that was kind of how data got us going 
uh, mm -hmm. to figure out what the issues were, who is affected by this, how many people are affected by this, to try to quantify these things in broad strokes from a bird's eye view was kind of the aim of the data analysis. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a little bit to be said too of how much of the data work you don't see on, you know, in the finished product, you know, there's, mm -hmm. I have folders and folders on hard drives of, of, like I said, queries that I was like, this would be a crazy query to do. And I said, Ryan, can you do it? And, and uh, I, Ryan has been a little bit humble. I believe he actually crashed his computer at one point because he tried to build a data set that was so <laughs> big, it just like exploded his, his, his tech. Um, but, you know, he and I would just sit down in the LA Times newsroom for, you know, hours, just looking at graphs that he came up with kind of to, to a, to pick out which wells I would go out in the field and the photographers on this who were amazing would go out in the field and, and shoot. And, you know, I'd go find people around them. And so, you know, it, there was a lot of kind of this, this finagling uh, of the data to figure out where our case study should be. Um, and, and then on the business side too, I, I, one of the areas where I did get a tip was uh, about this, this major, one of the three major oil companies in California, you know, I had somebody whispering in my ear that, Hey, this company, maybe look at them, they're probably going to go under. And, um, mm -hmm. and so we had people, everyone said, no, no, they're, they're fine. And, uh, you know, I definitely believed in it. And, and Ryan and I really, you know, we got in the data and the, the data kind of started to show that, Hey, this, this might be a real issue. And, you know, uh, fast forward six months, the company went from, you know, mm -hmm. one of the biggest to bankrupt. So I think that kind of proved our point with an exclamation mark. Um, but a lot of that was, was data-driven looks that we, you know, that we ended up and that ended up, you know, might've ended up as a photograph or a chart or a graph mm -hmm. in the story, but it just, it was kind of interesting how that would pivot from, you know, from numbers to kind of what you see in the final product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The map is the interactive map is crazy. I've, sh I've shared it with some of my friends who live in uh, California and it's, the, it's exactly the reaction, Ryan, that you were talking about of people saying, whoa, whoa, I had no idea this can't possibly be how could this be? Um, what kinds of um, impact have you seen from the story? Has any anything changed? Anybody gotten outraged and done anything? Or is it just, you know, wow, here's this really kind of scary situation and nobody's acting on it? it right. You might know you might know more than 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 me on this, but you know, it, it definitely, I think Reese one of the reasons we did the project now is, is, or a year ago now was there, there's a conversation ongoing in California. And I think a project like this is interesting because for people who don't live in California, you think this very progressive green state, mm -hmm. which is really not, I mean, Los Angeles is in many ways is, is an oil town. And, and so there, there was a lot of conversation around, there was a lot of political infighting over trying to get buffer zones uh, to move wells away from schools and buildings and homes um, so I don't think there was any specific leg legislative change. I know that this, that this caused a buzz in Sacramento. And I mean, uh, I, as far as I know, several hundred thousand people read it. And I, there, I do have anecdotal things. Like I, I would get calls afterwards where someone would say, Hey, I, I put my, you know, I was looking to buy a house and I put my address into the map and wow, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of oil wells underneath this neighborhood I was going to buy. And should I buy your house? And I was like, I'm not going to be a realtor here, but, but I'm glad you have more information to make these decisions. So right. I think a lot of it was kind of opening people's eyes, but, but Ryan, mm -hmm. maybe you can let me know if there's some cool, some cool impact that I missed. No, I think, I think that's right. The impact is less uh, concrete than, you know, this particular law was changed, but I think there is a, a very robust discussion going on right now when it comes to buffer zones, which was kind of something we were mm -hmm. trying to communicate. Uh, it was, it was a major part of the analysis. It's a very technical part of the analysis. You take the well, you draw, 500 feet from it, 1,000 feet from it, 2,500 feet from it to see, you know, we were trying to figure out how many people live in these areas. What's the breakdown when it comes to people of color? What's the breakdown when it comes to income? Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I, I did notice last week, and I, it's been a year and I continue to get uh, emails about this story. Last week, the city council in LA, the L Los Angeles City Council, um, had a deliberation over what their authority is when it comes to uh, requiring buffer zones. So um, people, there, there are people who argue that strict buffer zones are needed. A 2,500 foot setback from a well uh, would be the safe distance for someone to, you know, uh, to, to avoid kids growing up near wells who can develop asthma, develop breathing problems, have just have to deal with the smell of sulfur in their lives all the time. Um, 
And this discussion going on at city council, I think gets at uh, what Jim was saying earlier about power and who has it. Uh, the city council is trying to figure out, do we have the authority to set up strict setbacks? And what, they're, what the city council is worried about is a legal fight. If yeah. they were to set up uh, strict buffers, um, they would face pushback from the oil companies. And a, a very minor part of our story uh, that I think is very illustrative of what happens in California is that we found out that uh, this, I believe you can call them a lobbying group, the Western States Petroleum Association or WISPA is the biggest lobbyist in Sacramento when it comes to money they spend lobbying uh, state house legislat legislators. And a similar push and pull is happening at the local, if it's happening in Sacramento, it's happening at every locality with oil and gas extraction. My understanding of the city council deliberation is that they have determined they have the right to set up the buffers. Whether they do it is gonna be a separate discussion down the line, but activists, mm -hmm. we're rightly celebrating this. I think that you know the, the city has determined there's nothing preventing us from doing it. They just are now maybe gonna look into like a cost benefit analysis of what would it take to set up these, because uh, you know homes are currently not, 2,500 feet from wells, they're two feet right. from wells. Right. You're on top of a well. Um, so certain things are gonna have to change if buffer zones are, strict buffer zones are set at a local level or at the state level. So that's something I think our stories contributed to the conversation around that um, and really got people thinking about that mm -hmm. issue or at least some people thinking about it that hadn't thought about it before. Plenty of people have been pushing this for decades. Um, so that's what I am keeping an eye out for down the line when it comes to impact. From our and, and just the, the one point I want to make off there that, that, that both Jim and Ryan were talking about was kind of this power dynamic and, and also the ICIJ team, you know, the, the, the kind of, you know, nuts case study that, that, that you all found, you know, we, we do this because there's a power imbalance. And so you're looking for those power imbalances in society, which I know is a very general and kind of aspirational idea, but one thing that, that we really pushed on and, and Ryan did a great data analysis on was, was who, who is this impacting? Are we, are we talking about mm -hmm. something where people have chosen to move into a mansion next to these wells? I mean, to give an extreme example, or are we talking about purely Latino communities um, you know, who, who have to breathe this stuff every day and will we'll obviously have long-term impact? So we, we, we tried to keep an eye out towards uh, not pushing the story there if it wasn't there, but, but, but understanding that, that that that's what I've seen in this coverage in South Africa and in Appalachia mm -hmm. and in the Caribbean is you often have very specific slices of society dealing with these types of issues. So we wanted to make sure we kept an eye to that and, and that power dynamic as well. Great. I'm gonna throw us open to questions now. I think Amber has asked if you uh, if students have questions, if you could send them into the chat. I don't see anything yet, but. In the meantime, while people are coming up with questions, um, Shola, I'm gonna circle back around to you. Sydney had said that there was some um, more detail on uh, impact that you might be able to uh, tell us about from, uh, from your story. Sure. Um, I think the first type of in impact we saw it when, right before publishing the story. So actually two weeks before when we went for comment to the government, the current government of Angola, so the new president. Um, uh, right after, you know, um, BBC and our Portuguese partner went there and interviewed all these authorities, they decided to um, to take action, and in fact, um, basically sued uh, Dos Santos and um, her husband, um, and said that uh, they had um, basically stolen uh, one billion dollars worth of assets from Angola. And the case is still ongoing. Obviously, um, they have denied any wrongdoing. But this was the first impact. And then after we published, we saw um, one after the other um, countries like Portugal, the Netherlands, and other and authorities in other countries um, uh, deciding to um, do something, which is quite uh, interesting because these same countries had uh, allowed her to open banks mm -hmm. and open accounts, you know, for decades, really, until um, uh, some journalists decided to talk about it. 
So, you know, um, it's great. Uh, we welcome any sort of impact and investigation into this, but it's, um, you know, sometimes it's a bit hypocritical. Um, <laughs> 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 and and um, so a few weeks ago, her husband actually passed away. Um, and so we are trying now to understand what's going to happen to all these cases that are still open. And uh, because he was, um, you know, in charge of a lot of companies um, and in which she had interests, but in others in which she didn't have interests. Um, so uh, we really don't know what's going on, what, what will happen with the, with the money, um, you know, millions of dollars at this point. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So interestingly, um, one of the only countries that has failed to take action or um, trace any assets is the United States. So um, um, eh, sort of um, in, in answer to the, one of these questions, did we talk to Isabel? Um, our partners um, at the BBC and Sheila Wehrhouse, BBC, um, uh, our French partners talked, the radio partners talked to Syndica, right? Um, um, and um, did we say that there was corruption? Yes, we did. We, um, we um, laid it all out there and we talked about the unscrupulous deals and um, detailed them in some length. And her reaction was, you know, she essentially denied it and threatened lawsuits, but she didn't sue. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't admit it. Um, basically, it was interesting that BBC News, so not BBC Panorama, which was the prog program yeah. working with yeah. us, that's kind of the equivalent of Frontline um, in, in the UK. BBC News had um, arranged an interview with her for a separate thing, but this was a few days before we were supposed to publish. And obviously we had gone to her for comment like one month before, and she had always said, we will think about it. And the lawyers eventually said no. And so we got the opportunity and basically help, uh, used the BBC interview to ask our questions. Um, and it was great because everyone really wants to hear the voice, <laughs> want to talk to these people after, uh, you know, researching and reporting on their lives for months. Um, so, yeah, that was quite cool. Sydney, one of the questions, uh, Dean Gilger asked a question about what's, do we know what's behind the U.S. failure to take action? Um, or can we just guess? <laughs> yeah, I think you can just guess. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Sheila has more observation. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Um, Sheila, what do you think? Um, I, I, well, I mean, um, the U.S. is considered the biggest uh, tax haven in the world, and there is a reason for that. <laughs> and you know, um, there are everyone is using it. So um, sure, they can investigate it, but until they allow rich people, criminals and whatnot to use the several uh, schemes in this country. I don't know how um, relevant those investigations can be. Sydney, I think you're, you're muted. I think you're trying to yeah. add. There so, you go. Yeah. so we did um, uncover um, several um, shell companies that she had in the United States. There was a couple of Delaware outfits um, and we found a, a small parcel in some, uh, I don't know, some rural place somewhere. Um, so we know that there are assets here. Um, and, and we didn't uncover a lot of it, but we suspect that there's more. And mm -hmm. um, it's incredibly easy to, to uh, hide it in the United States, um, easier mm -hmm. than many other places. One of the questions in the chat um, on a more general uh, level is, uh, you know, both of these stories turned out to be, you know, big stories. Um, but as investigative journalists, how often do you think you found something good and then it doesn't pan out? I'll throw that to any. Mark, you want to take a shot at that one? Sure. Yeah, I think that's a I, that's a fantastic question. I actually uh, turned in a draft of a story the other day that was supposed to be uh, accountability in, in millions and millions of state funding in California. And I really 
you know, don't think that California is being corrupt. I just think they're being slow in this thing. So, you know, so that story pivoted to why are you being slow, which is, you know, much less sexy, but I'd rather be, you know, accurate than wrong. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think for, for the things that Ryan and I were doing, because it's, it's kind of, it, it, it had a very large academic type thing. You know, we, we were pretty confident going in that there, that there was something, um, you know, there is this type of reporting that I think the jury is still out on this, but, but it's kind of what we did, which was, which was forward looking. Um, and I know ProPublica, uh, and, or was the Houston Chronicle, but some people were doing that and they kind of predicted that Hurricane Harvey would do what it would do. And so there, there's those types of stories too, where it's, you know, you, you, you essentially have a little more leeway to take the evidence and, and arrange it and say, this is what could happen. Um, you know, it doesn't, it, it's, I think it's rare where what, what happened with that bankruptcy, like I said, Ryan and I were proved right. Like six months later, that was totally nothing to do with us and, and was just kind of happenstance, but, you know, totally you, you, and I, I go, going back to the first thing I said, that's why being able to fund nonprofit investigative newsrooms or, or papers like the Los Angeles times having enough subscriptions and ads where they can support a, a robust data team like they have. It just takes time. Um, and, you know, a lot of good reporting um, comes out of beats, but even that takes time because you need years to mm-hmm. develop that beat. And then you need to, to, to have some time off to, to go look into it. So, you know, if it's, if it's not the right thing, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow. But I think one of the best skills in journalism is knowing when a story is not worth it for whatever reason, and just kind of swallowing that, taking lessons from it, moving on. So, but it, it definitely happens. Janet, if I could uh, throw out one thing. Oh, sure. um, uh, I think we've all had that experience where something doesn't pan out. But I'll tell you what has happened to me more often over time is that a story may start out one way, but it starts heading in another direction. And I think one of the greatest challenges that all of us in, in investigative pieces, and enterprise pieces have is to stay flexible. Mm -hmm. Uh, to realize that maybe this isn't exactly what you thought, but there's something over here that looks very good and you need to be flexible enough to follow that. Uh, It's complicated though, because the heart of great reporting, of course, is to keep your nose to the grindstone, to not let obstacles get in your way, to push that string uphill, even though it's hard as it can be, uh, and to see that through. Mm -hmm. But you also need to have that kind of flexibility. I mean, on almost every big project Don Barlett and I did over the years started out slightly differently than it ended up. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we did our America, what went wrong uh, series with the Philadelphia Inquirer back in the early nineties, it was about what was happening to start out with what, why are these plants closing? People are told us this is America renewing itself. But as we got further into it, and we began examining the specific cases and talking to the specific people who were involved in those companies, people from the factory floor to the executive suite, we realized this was a lot bigger than just this plant closing. Mm -hmm. This was affecting a whole way of life for people in the middle class, the way they were losing jobs, losing some of their benefits, uh, not earning what they once did. Uh, Totally different than the way that whole project began. We didn't sit down one day and say, gee, the American middle class is getting hammered. Let's go out and do a story on it. Almost everything we did over time started out asking a question, test a hypothesis. Mm-hmm. Is the world running out of oil, which was a series we did many years ago? No, it wasn't. But there were a lot of stories that said it was. So uh, I think it's we have to be determined, of course, in, in our work and not give up and let, let obstacles get in our way. But at the same time, we have to also be flexible to realize that something may not be exactly what we thought, but it may even be a better story mm-hmm. if we adjust and, and absorb that information. That's great. And it really speaks to the, the wonderful note that Sydney read from her colleague about humility. Yes, um, approaching exactly. this work with humility is really essential. Sid, Sydney and I, by the way, Sydney, hello. <laughs> Sydney, <laughs> our, our Knight Ritter alumnus, and also uh, uh, deep admirers of uh, the late Jean Miller, uh, who uh, mm-hmm. was, of course, uh, such a mentor for her and was 
such an inspiration for all of us in journalism. So uh, mm -hmm. I have nothing to do with this judging, of course, but it's very wonderful to see you again on this in this situation, Cindy. So hello. We have just a couple of minutes and I'm going to try to kind of consolidate into a single question, several of the things that have been asked in the chat. And that, you know, if you are, say you're a reporter, um, you're a student journalist at Cronkite and your aspiration is to be where you folks are, to be doing investigative work. What kind of guidance would you give um, to someone who has their eye on that as, a, as they're beginning their career? <laughs> I think I can... I can start with that a little bit. Well, I, I started writing obits and, um, <laughs> and covering cops. And um, uh, I think, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to just say, oh, I'm going to be an investigative reporter. Mm -hmm. You still have to learn how to cover the county and, and figure out uh, how to um, deal with contracts and, you know, how to um, solve a homicide. and. Um, I don't know, I, you know, I think journalism's changed, but that's at least how I see it. But. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, writing obits is one of the great uh, teachers of investigative skills, I always thought. I had at least one really good investigative story that came out of um, a question one of my night side reporters asked about an obit. It turned into like a six-part series that won every investigative award we could find, so. Um, uh, for what it's worth, that's exactly how I started Kansas City. And uh, when I got a, a, a better assignment was to go out and cover a two-bit robbery. I mean, at least mm -hmm. got outside the building. <laughs> but it's amazing uh, the rules you learn in an obituary because an obituary, there's not a lot of creativity in most of them. But it's astonishing how many potential errors you can make. So it taught you from the very beginning, the sanctity of verification, check names. It also told me another rule that I, I want to pass on for what it's worth. It taught me to never assume, never assume how somebody's name is spelled, never assume who will talk to you, never assume what document you may find, and never assume you even know what you think you know. You know, nail that whole thing down firmly uh, before you go with it. So as you were saying, humility is very much a part of our business. And uh, we relearn those lessons over and over again as we go through our careers. Mm -hmm. Well, we're coming up right at the, at the top of the hour and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. And I'm not sure that we could find a better sentiment or thought to end on than that one. So I'll let Jim have the last word. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you so much. It was it was um, it was great to have all of you here. Congratulations to our winners. Thank you for being so generous in sharing your experiences and your knowledge and your advice. Um, I feel like I learned a lot tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Nice talking with all of you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Congratulations again. Thanks. Thank you.